But the first thing, of course, I want to do is salute all of you who made the trip to come here. This is our 90th anniversary. <laughs> For any business, especially a small family business, to get to, get to 90 years is quite remarkable. And as you know, the last two years, any business to get to this year is quite <laughs> remarkable. And any of you that were here at Cape in the last two years, getting here was remarkable. But we're here and we're thrilled that you guys are here to celebrate with us. Uh, you see in the program, uh, we're gonna do some things very straightforward. In fact, in planning for this retreat, we don't have to make things up. We went back to the 85th anniversary. We looked at the program, made a few tweaks here or there, some special surprises. But it's our chance to share our history. Those of you who were here last night, of course, got the best history tour in the world when Pete gave his walking tour of the grounds. We're not going to try to duplicate that. That was too amazing. Let's give Pete a big hand. That was fantastic. We have a lot of things planned for our 90th anniversary season. This was kind of be like the crowning jewel. This was the weekend we were going to set aside. But all season long, we're going to be celebrating 90 years. Whether it's with the 90th anniversary t-shirts, I've seen a few out there with yours on, good job. Whether it's uh, our token hunt, there are tokens hidden somewhere around the grounds. People have already found a few. And uh, we're gonna do another special event later in July, closer to the actual date when our grandparents purchased the place in 1932, hence this being the 90th anniversary. So stay tuned for those. But what I'm gonna share in the beginning is really the whole reason any of us are here today, and that is Cape and Springs water. <laughs> Good stuff. If the water wasn't here, none of us would be here. This would be a forgotten nook of West Virginia. Actually, it might even still be a forgotten nook of the Commonwealth of Virginia, as you learned a little bit last night. But Cape and Springs water has literally flowed through the entire American experience. So I'm gonna give you a little bit about the water where it comes from as used on the property and bring it up to the present day. And what's so special about something as simple as H2O. All right, some of you have your own testimonials can share those, but for right now, we're gonna start with the year that Pete started with, which is 1765. That's the first time we knew a European settler came through the area. We all know, of course, this was an area where there were a lot of Native Americans. There were none that had settlements here, at this, but this was a pilgrimage site. This was a holy sacred site. One of the ways we know that is because there's some ancient petroglyphs behind the spring house indicating that this is the place when they were going to market for people to find it was going to be a place of healing. The whole word that we use today, which of course we pronounce Capon, is a much anglicized Native American word that means either medicine waters, healing waters, lost to be found again. There's many different translations, but again, all focused on the water. But Henry Fry was the first one gets credit for it. In fact, the story goes he was hunting bear right up on the mountain there, came down, probably the last time someone saw a bear up there, except for last week on the Red Trail, that's a different story. He came down, he was thirsty, he found the water agreeable, he did a dutiful husband, he went back to Winchester to pick up his wife, who was ill at the time, and she came here, and she was healed of all her isms. Okay, well, word spread from there, this is good stuff. Well, 1765, we're not even a country. Finally, by late 1700s, as Pete explained, this became property of the Commonwealth of Virginia. They saw the golden opportunity to make a lot of money because they were making tons of money with their other springs establishment over in Bath, Virginia. And of course, it's all about location, location, location. Can you get here? And of course, Bath had an easy access down through uh, where the wagon trails were going. And so they got lots of people there. That didn't happen here. So finally, it took in the 1850s, had a company out of Baltimore, built a mountain house that stood right here, built this pavilion that we see right now, which is the bathhouse, and that began finally a time where people were coming here, taking the waters. So Pete went through a lot of that history up until the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and that's where I'm gonna pick up the story. So by 1910 or so, Cape and Springs water had an international reputation. It had been a prescribed medicine for over 60 years. <laughs> Right, so that's right. When he was explaining about the resident doctor, you would come here. You would go into his office. He would check out what was wrong with you. He would reach into his medicine cabinet, pull out the most potent medicine of the day, write you a prescription for Cape and Springs water. Right, he would tell you how much to drink, what time to drink in it, 
went to soaking it and all that. And it worked. If it didn't work, people would have left here, gone back home and said, ah, they're making stuff up. Nothing happened to me, but that's not what happened. You read through the old literature, incredible testimonials about the healing properties of Cape and Springs water. So this lasted, as we say, into the early 19-teens. But the big thing that happened was 1911 when the mountain house burned down to the ground. This place was lost, it was abandoned. As Pete explained, this was the ending of the era of the spas of the Virginias. There were dozens and dozens of these spas, but by the mid-1920s, only a handful of them were left. Something catastrophic, catastrophic like a fire took them all out. That would have been the default future of Cape and Springs. In fact, it started to be the default future. The place was abandoned. Basically, people were saying, yeah, the place has fallen down. It's, it, it's in disrepair. We don't really want to go there. We actually want the water. So instead of us making the huge trek to you, why don't you put the water on trains and send it to us? And that's exactly what happened. By the mid-1920s, Cape and Springs water had home and office delivery to 25 major U.S. cities. All right? We are used to the bottled water industry today, multi-billion dollar industry. But back in the 1920s, it was kind of a new and crazy idea. Think of the old milkman days, all right? They would bring your bottles, leave it on your stoop, pick up the empties, refill them at whatever subscription service you had. So think about major U.S. cities doing this in the 1920s. In fact, so popular was it that the 1924 U.S. Olympic team trained exclusively with Cape and Springs water. So we say, if you feel Olympic-like while you're here, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> so popular that by 1928, the next time the Olympic teams trained, they went to the president of the US, U.S. Olympic Committee and tried to get authorization to ship it overseas so the athletes could have it all the way up to the day of competition. All right, think about that. Water, very heavy, bottled in glass, very heavy, very expensive to ship it overseas. So the president of the Olympic Committee had to authorize this and he didn't take things at face value. He did his own research. He talked to the athletes, the coaches, had his own chemist <coughs> test the water. And then the conclusion was, yeah, this must be good stuff. So it's nice when we go into our archives and have a copy of the letterhead of the stationery of the president of the U.S. Olympic Committee. <coughs> the signature at the bottom is one you actually recognize. That gentleman's name was Douglas MacArthur. Now, he went on to some other things. <laughs> but in the 1920s, he thought it was pretty good stuff. And so did a clerk in Philadelphia, who in 1923 got all his money together, all his friends' money together, all their friends' money together, accumulated about $100,000 in 1923 to buy a piece of paper and to get the necessary supplies to be able to cart the water and bottle it in one market, Philadelphia. Well, he thought he was going to have his fame and fortune riding the coattails of this water business but if you'd done any research at all, you'd have found out exactly the wrong time to get in the water business. What was going on? Well, there were several outstanding lawsuits from the FDA trying to close down anyone making health claims. It was the beginning of the pharmaceutical industry. It was the beginning of a lot of snake oil salesmen. The American Medical Association was getting a lot of pressure on the FDA to say, shut them down. Let's just lump them all together. Spring waters were all part of the deal. So. Basically, they took this clerk in Philadelphia about five years fighting legal battles on and off with the FDA just for the right to be in the water business. Finally, in 1928, it came to a head. The FDA, on a liquor warrant, this was still during Prohibition, seized all the water he had on hand in his, fair, in his warehouse in Philadelphia in one bold move to completely put him out of business. Well, it, was, it could have been successful, but with some legal wrangling, he was able to postpone that. But at this point, he really only had two decisions in life. Put yourself in his shoes. You either be right out of town on a rail in bankruptcy and disgrace with all, lost all your money, your friend's money, or you jump down the rabbit hole and fight the FDA till the finish. And that's what he decided to do. The next three years, the legal battles were very involved and complicated, but in some ways very straightforward. He would appear in court and say the water's fine. The FDA would appear in court and say the water's bad. The judge would say, I have no idea. Let's send it off to independent labs, see what they say. Well, they did that, and every time it came back from that, those laboratories, it was the finest water that lab had ever tested. Well, that should have ended the case, but that's not how our judiciary, judicial system works. So the FDA would say, I appeal. It would go to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. Finally, in 1931, 
it was time to, to finally decide this. It reached the U.S. Supreme Court. That's right, Cape and Springs water is going to be decided in the highest court in the land. So what are the justices going to do at the time? Well, they're going to look at the evidence. And in front of them was affidavits, signed documents from 15 physicians who had an average of 20 years experience with the water testify under oath that this is good stuff. Well, that was enough for them to read it and take it. They said, we're not even going to hear the case. Case closed. Hooray! This clerk in Philadelphia then spent the next 20 years being the most successful bottler of Cape and Springs water in the history of the world. <laughs> for about three months. All right, with an adversary like the FDA, that's not going to how it's going to work. In fact, he had other worries, bigger almost, than the FDA. He did not own the spring. He was only a bottler and distributor of water in Philadelphia. The owners of the spring, if you were here on Pete's History Tour, you know, they had bigger things in mind. They wanted to build back a huge resort. They wanted to raise tons of capital. And how were they going to do it? They were going to sell distribution rights on top of distribution rights in a very clever financial arrangement known as a pyramid scheme. <laughs> the whole thing collapsed in 1932, like a lot of things collapsed in 1932. And on the county courthouse steps in Romney, oh, well, this is a test after Pete he said he was going to give you a quiz. For how much money? Anyone remember? $16,500 on the county court of steps on July 9th, 1932. The highest and best bidder, you've guessed it by now, our grandfather, Lou Austin. Now we own complete title of the spring. He won all his legal battles, so he spent the next 20 years being the most successful baller of Cape of Springs water in the history of the world. For about three months. All right, things don't end that quickly and easily. Uh, but his faith in the water has never uh, wavered through all this time. He actually spent the next 20 years in and out of legal battles with Cape and Springs Water and the FDA and other, other issues of their trying to put it out. But while these legal battles were going on, he was still selling water. He still had great customers uh, throughout the United States. And he had great dreams of the water. He was coming up with all sorts of products. He had a classic ginger ale that beat Canada dry and taste test. He was taking uh, clay that was in the local area where Cape Springs water was and making skincare creams. He was testing out on his second son and seeing how that was going to work out. <laughs> he, cre he created a flavored ice. It was a precursor to a slushy or a snow cone. He even in 1935 was pushing hard to make Capen beer. Well, he couldn't get any buyers for that. It didn't happen, but that was one of his goals. So he kept doing all these products. He wanted to be successful. People were still enjoying the water. He was getting amazing testimonials about the water. But during all that time, he still had these legal battles. And his friends were saying, what a hassle, all these water legal battles. Once you fix up some of these buildings, we'll come on vacation. We'll tell our friends, they'll tell their friends. 90 years later, we're celebrating the 90th anniversary of the resort, not the water business. In fact, the conclusion of the water story, of course, goes actually into the 1950s. And when we get to the decades in review, you'll see, see some of that. But in the 1950s, Cape and Springs water, even though these legal battles were going on, was the official water, wait for it, of the entire US Congress. That's right, every House of Representative member, every US Senator were drinking nothing but Cape and Springs water in their DC offices, while the FDA was still trying to pull it off the shelves. Finally, in the 1950s, early 1960s, Lou Austin decided to take it off the market commercially, and it's been off ever since. He wanted to make it available to anyone who wanted to drink it. So when you're here at Cape and Springs, where can you get the famous Cape and Springs water? Well, we have a very easy answer now. It's everywhere. Well, what about everywhere? Pretty much. So. We fill it up from the spring. In fact, afterwards, uh, we'll open up the spring if you want to see inside it after the reception you're milling about. But it's gravity fed. It's uphill here. So it fills into a reservoir, a second reservoir. We now have a third reservoir that allows us to put the water in all the guest rooms. Since we have so many of our longtime guests here, you remember the only place you'd be able to draw a cape of water in your room was in a bottle. All right, no bottle in your room because why? It's coming right out of your tap. That's right, it's in the sinks, it's in the showers. All the food is prepared with the spring water. It's in the kitchens. It's in the spa, which some of you already enjoyed today. Great job. It's in the swimming pool, where it comes out at a refreshing 65 degrees. And we say refreshing because geologically speaking, 
Cape and Springs water is a warm spring. But for those of you who joined us in the pool before breakfast this morning, you might think otherwise. But it is considered a warm spring. It comes from a depth of about 1,600 feet, which is roughly the distance from the main house up to the spring house. That's how deep the reservoir they've guesstimated, the underground aquifer that holds the water. The last 300 feet it's coming through is an Ariscone sandstone, which acts as a natural filter, which is why it has that sweet, clean taste to it. You go less than a half mile down the road toward the fish pond, that whole area down there is called Iron Spring. Why? The water's coming right up through the shale, the metamorphic rock. There's a lot of sulfur, iron. Turns things uh, yellow, has a funny smell to it. Well, you don't worry about that with a famous Gaping Spring because it's coming up right through the sandstone and filters all that out. When it reaches the surface, Roughly the Cape and Springs group, which is a collection of springs, is about 100 gallons a minute. All right, that's more than enough for our needs here. When we're full capacity, roughly 65% of that volume is used as resort. So there's always excess. So think about in the winter when we're closed, we're not using any of the water. So there's no pumping. We're never de depleting the water table. It's coming up whether we're here or not. It's doing its own thing. We're just redistributing it. They've guesstimated the times that the water came down as rain hit the surface of the earth, gather underground, and then come back up to be over 70 years. So like a fine wine, Cape and Springs water has taken a while to complete the hydrologic cycle. So if you can do the mental math on that, the next day it rains here very soon, next week sometime, it's gonna take 70 years for people to enjoy that water. And as I look around, that might be only three or four people who might be around for that. <laughs> but those who are around right now, we're drinking Cape and water that came down 70 some years ago when our grandparents and some of our parents, aunts and uncles were here. Now we know the water volume hasn't changed since they've been recording it, which has been well over 100 years. So even if it didn't rain a single drop, the next 100, 70 years, we'll still keep it seven, 70 years, we'll still be getting 100 gallons a minute from the collection of springs. So talk about having a quality and quantity. So we're not gonna run out of Cape water anytime soon. We won't put any fears of that going away. Cape water is here to stay. It doesn't change, they tease us. Nothing around here ever changes the Cape, it all starts with the water. All right? That's why we can let our fountains run all the time. It drives a lot of people crazy, especially our friends from out west, water conservation, very important issue. But here at Cape and Springs, we got plenty of water. We're not gonna run out. Now what's so great about Cape and Springs water? Let's get to the meat of the matter. Those of you who've been coming for a while have developed your own theories and testimonials, but you don't have to guess because every day when you walk inside the main house, you drink at that wonderful fountain as a filling station to fill up your water bottle. You look up, you see the old advertisement. It says, drink Cape and water. Why? It eliminates acid. So that should give you the clue why a prominent physician from the big city would spend a whole summer out here prescribing the medicine because he knew that it would neutralize a buildup of acid in the body. And even then they knew the buildup of acid, mostly because of the stress and tension we put on ourselves or the acidic things we put into our bodies cause so much of the disease in the human body. So where were they pre prescribing it for? What areas? First one, digestive system. Think about the proper balance of pH. The second one, the muscular and joint system. Think of the isms and itises of the world, inflammation. Just like Mrs. Henry Fry, all her isms, that makes sense. The third one, the largest organ of the body itself, the skin. Very important for your immune system to have proper balance of pH of your skin. But I know, myself, at least six couples who told me privately and publicly that it was only after coming here, they were trying for years and years to conceive, it was only after drinking the water something happened. So we say, be careful out there. <laughs> Powerful stuff. <laughs> And then you get the occasional skeptic guest who will say, ah, I don't know about all that, but I do know it tastes good. I end up drinking more water while I'm here that has to contribute to better health because most of us walk around dehydrated. We don't drink good old H2O. We drink other beverages that can dehydrate us, usually around five o'clock, for example. All right? So drinking Cape of Water. So what are we walking around from an anatomy point of view? We're bags of water, right? 60% of our bodies are water. 85% of our brain. So yes, drinking Cape and Springs water does make you smarter. <laughs> Unproven, but some people think that. <laughs> now, the other great thing about Cape and Springs water is, not only is it alkaline, but we're always learning more about history, 
and Pete will be the first one to tell you. He gets more information, someone else will come in and say, you know, my great great uncle was there and brings a piece of the history we didn't know, fills in some blanks. Well, that happens with science too. If you're ever in the spring house, you'll see it will bubble up every once in a while. And historically, I, I always assume from my hydrogeology background, it was trapped carbon dioxide just coming to the surface. Makes sense. But we had some grad students here from WVU who found out a number of years ago that we have a high concentration of dissolved oxygen in our water. Why is that important? Oxygen, very important delivery device for nutrients down to the cellular level. If you look at the waters that are on the market today, the first thing they do is they alkalize them. That makes sense. The second thing they do is they oxygenate them. Super water is a lot of oxygen, a lot of alkalinity. Well, we have that naturally occurring in Cape Springs. And I know some of you have teased us in the past, oh, what about the lithium in the water? Is that why everyone around here is so happy? <laughs> no, it's the nice people to come here. The traces of the lithia don't really register by today's standards, but historically speaking, if you could say you had a lithiated spring, that puts you in a higher class of springs. <coughs> that brings you up to date with Cape and Springs water. We always make sure that it's available, not only to you when you're here, but to the entire community. It was very important to us, especially during COVID, when people were craving something to help their health, they could drive up here in our community spigot just down by the lower parking lot and fill up to the heart's content. And people do drive up here from D.C. and Baltimore, and South Carolina. We don't know where these people are coming from, filling up containers uh, for their own use and for the use of their family. And you're welcome to do that anytime, whether we're open or not. And some of you know the drill, you bring up your own containers. If you don't have any, we take care of that. We put in containers that you can take home. That's probably more than you wanted to know about the water but I always love sharing that. So let me take a drink. I also like sharing my grandfather's book, You Are Greater Than You Know, because we don't have to make up our history. He wrote it down. And uh, this is something we make available for all our guests in, in, the, in their rooms to read about. And this is a chance for us to go down memory lane within our own family. <coughs> And one of the things I share when I'm going about to various groups and trying to give them a, a sense of what CAPE is all about, because you guys know, you finally give up and you say, you just gotta go there, you'll figure it out. <laughs> but the, one of the parts I love is when he sits down and, and wrote, when he wrote this book in the 1950s, he had a chance to pause and reflect of how in the world did this place come into his hands. So he paints a picture, which I will do for you. Picture if you can. Suppose at the lowest point of the depression, a good friend comes to you for advice and tells you his story. He has come into an old abandoned summer resort hidden away in the mountains, 30 miles from the nearest town. The road leading into it is narrow, mountainous, and the spots dangerous. The place is without utilities, neither electricity nor gas nor telephone. There is no kitchen, dining room, or living room. The main building had been burned to the ground 22 years before. The few remaining buildings are of frame construction and badly in need of repairs. The furniture in them is meager and obsolete. The beds are hard and uncomfortable. There's no plumbing anywhere. One has to go outside for water, which comes from a mineral spring, health-giving and of generous supply. Sounds like a great place for a vacation, doesn't it? <laughs> Your friend has no money. And because the depression is on, he finds it tough to raise money. He then says to you, that's my situation. Now, here's what I'm supposed to do with this place in a few years' time, and I'm asking your advice how to go about doing it. I'm supposed to change this picture so it will look more like this. A beautiful and appealing summer resort, adequately caring for 200 people and about 100 fairly modern rooms, almost all with private bath, living room and dining room to meet the needs, two nine-hole <coughs> golf courses, one of regular size, the other pitch and putt, tennis courts, swimming pool, a private fishing pond, and a thousand foot acreage on nearby river, and all other forms of recreation found at a quality resort. I'm to acquire and operate several farms where I'm to raise all the necessary vegetables, fruits, grains, turkeys, chickens, ducks. I'm to have modern machinery to meet all the needs, tractors, bulldozers, trucks, mechanical farm equipment. My land holdings are to increase from 320 acres to almost 5,000. I'm supposed to build a buzz, dozen new buildings, including a deep freeze plant, alone worth $30,000. All right, let that sink in a minute. 
Your friend pauses and then says, I've told you what I've come into, and I've told you what I'm supposed to make of it. Now I'll tell you the rules under which I'm supposed to operate. I'm not supposed to raise any capital. I'm not allowed any mortgage or bond or other indebtedness to be placed against the property. Everything I acquire, I must own outright. I must get a good road for the 30 mile stretch leading to the property. And I'm supposed to get the summer months booked a year ahead. All this growth must be accomplished without publicity or advertising. Your friend stops. This time, as if he's told you all. You know, however, he hasn't told you everything. He hasn't mentioned the greatest obstacle of all, and his failure to recognize it as a roadblock points to the acuteness of his problem. The thing your friend forgot to tell you was that he had no taste for the job he was supposed to do. He didn't believe it could be done under the existing circumstances. His mind was on something else, distributing the water, not on developing the hotel. He'll soon be wasting thousands of dollars on the wrong thing, and it'll be years before he can be persuaded to apply his energies in the proper place. You suspect this, but how can you tell it to your friend? You know he lacks both the vision to see what is ahead and the patience to see it through, yet he's expecting some kindly and encouraging advice from you. How can you honestly give it? You wonder how one so inept and inexperienced as to get himself tied up into a worthless contract with an outfit having several huge encumbrances on record against it could have wiggled out of this awful mess in the first place. And not only to come out of it free, but have it handed to him as if on a silver platter. He continues. So here I am today, a complete failure in the thing I most wanted to do and which for about 32 years I worked hardest to achieve. And on the other hand, the thing which at first was most distasteful to me, and the amazing growth of which I could not have envisioned at all, has become an unusually successful venture. It is a strange development, all too strange to be an accident. And then he concludes. We are for the time being trustees for this beautiful and blessed spot and therefore in the picture. But it is our guests, now our warm friends, who have done the rest. We were not hotel people as we approached this work back in 1933 in fear and uncertainty. Not knowing any better, we operated the resort as if we would run our own home. You know what this place was like when we took over two decades ago. And we know who brought about the change from a handful of guests to where our capacity is taxed a good deal of the time. This work was done for us by the kind words of friends. Theirs was a major contribution to a unique development, a Shangri-La, many have called it, where hosts, guests, coworkers, and community get together in happiness and with benefit to all. <laughs>